Hello, everyone. My name is Cheryl Crooks. I am executive director of Cascadia International Women's Film Festival. It's my pleasure today to welcome our director, Kaveri Call, who is the director of the Bengali, Cascadia's uh, film that we are showing for Black History Month. Uh, it's a wonderful documentary about a woman uh, from New Orleans who traces her family history to India. And uh, she'll be talking today with Shirley Jo Finney, who is a director in her own right, and who is a member of Cascadia's team as a member of our final film selection committee. So without further ado, I will let them talk with you. Thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. Okay. <laughs> we'll see you later, or maybe you can stay. <laughs> Okay, without further ado, hi, Kaveri, how are you? I'm well, thank you. I hope you are too. It's so wonderful to be talking to you again. I know, I know. I, um, I, I let the audience know that uh, uh, we had spoke briefly to meet each other for the first time and had a wonderful like 40 minute conversation uh, where most of that 40 min minutes, 20 minutes, of it were, were us laughing. Um, so I'm, I am really excited about getting into this. I, one of the things I had said to you uh, when we were talking was I was going to, cause I was fascinated about documentary filmmaking and I wanted to approach it from my POV of the questions I wanted to ask uh, to you about uh, the medium and also we will go into Bengali, the, 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 the film that you did. Um, and before we begin, one of the, not before, but one of the things that um, I wanted to talk about is most people know documentary filmmaking as a non-fictional motion picture with, um, uh, based in, what, based in uh, reality. Yeah, is that a good definition for it? Which is used for education and also for uh, historical narratives. Well, can I define documentary? Well, that was gonna be my next question. How would you define it? I think a documentary is a nonfiction film uh, drawn from the director's uh, view of the world and the people in the world. It can be entertaining, informative, educational, inspiring. It can be all those things. And I think the traditional view of a documentary locks it in uh, in a way that the form has been beyond for many, many years. Right, because we talked about how, how, how was documentaries looked upon, I guess, pre-60s, because 60s was a major, major shift uh, with the advent of uh, uh, portable cameras, move, you know, so that you could, op it, op it opened up the narrative. Am, is that right? That is right, the recognition of opening up the narrative. Earlier on, I think documentaries were presented to the world as reality. Uh, I think many of us know that reality can be subjective depending mm -hmm. on the director's point of view. Uh, I think that, uh, and the relationship the director has with the people in the film. So I think in the 60s with the advent of handheld cameras and more location shooting, more flexibility, things started to change and the larger awareness mm -hmm. about who tells whose stories and how are we telling it? Right, right. Um, so that was the 60s. Between now and, uh, well, between then and now, have you seen, because uh, one part of our conversation we had before was it opening up again. Um, and how has it opened up? What has been the shift if? Well, you know, the, let me just say that we're talking about two different things here mm -hmm. uh, that need to collide, need to intersect. One is how our documentary 
makers making documentaries and how the other is how are they being perceived right right oh good from those who are not making them who are broadcasting them programming them funding them so there's the the making point of view and the looking at documentaries point of view uh i can only speak really of my own experience. I think the recognition of the form as having many, many possibilities has been wonderful. Uh, I know in my own films, I aim to tell stories intimately. Mm -hmm. And out of that intimacy come, comes larger themes that are as important as any film that might be devoted just to the larger themes. I think there's more room for more different ways of storytelling now. And that's very reassuring for me, given who I am, the stories I tell, and the way I tell my stories. Right. And I think one of the other things I loved, and, and it was our, one of our connecting tissues, was um, when I asked you, and I didn't ask you in this way, but I'll ask you now about uh, your style, and we talked about feelings as as um, storytellers. That how important it was for your narratives and the thing that you that uh, well, I should I yeah the thing that draws you is the interconnectedness with people and really enhancing the feeling which makes your documentaries so poetic. So can you? Can, Thank you. That's so nice of you. I think the human experience is poetic. At the same time that it's uh, political um, and many other things. Uh, my filmmaking style looks for that intimacy because I do think people are at the heart of any story. Mm -hmm. And I look to work with people who understand that. That's part of the style. It's a collaborative medium. Right. Oh, good, good. I'm glad. See, you're entering all these things we talked about before, uh, which the next question would, would, is going to be the part of the thing about your process. What, and I'm going to be all fragmented and out of place, but one of the things, uh, how do you uh, gather your crew? What's your process about and your expectations of crew, and what is your process? Uh, a part of that, I'm asking a lot of questions. Once you get your subject, how do you gather your the subject or the idea, and how do you bring how do you how do you manifest that? And what is how do you pick your crew? Picking the crew is critical. I take my time doing that. That is key because I'm looking for people who are of course very, very skilled in their jobs. Uh, but at the same time, I'm looking for people who get the story. My production crew has to be people who know how to stay in the background, be invisible as I call it. Mm -hmm. They can't be shouting and yelling technical things that intimidate and overwhelm our subjects, um, they have to know where we're going. And they they can't just agree to going there, but they have to know what they'll get out of it and whether it has any meaning for them, the story, the locations, everything. So, so do you work with the same crew? I mean, over the years, you people have teams and the collaborations where they can have a verbal shorthand with people that they work and have a family. Do you have that? To some degree, sure. I've worked with the same cinematographer and the same editor a number of times. Mm -hmm. uh, my editor, many years ago now, when I first brought him onto a project, I told him very frankly, you know, I'm not bringing you on just because you have X, Y, and Z on your resume. I know you can craft the film. I'm bringing you on because you are deeply committed to theater, sociology, music, and cooking. <laughs> and I think his work shows that. He brings those feelings into the film. 
uh, the moods, the rhythms, the understanding of place, um, the pacing, the, the uh, storytelling, the evolution of the story, everything shows all of that as well as his craft skills. And the same with the cinematographer. Yeah. I needed someone who understood light and uh, angles and being silent and knowing that I wanted people, people's faces. You know, as soon as I saw people staring at Fatima when we arrived in the village, I knew that had to be part of the film. But that's a style of cinematography, quietly getting people looking. So what was before you spent, you said you told me you spent like six months in India. Mm -hmm. OK, so can you walk me through uh, in theater? We call it the table read where we have uh, design or production meetings where you were talking about the concept or, and, and like you said, what it is that uh, uh, that you wanted to achieve and what you think the heart of the piece is. Can you talk me through that? And also, also I'm, I'm asking two or three questions so that you could talk. And the other one is, how did, how did you, how did this project come to you? And when did you decide to do it? So is that, can you mix those? Well, I think what I'll do is separate the two questions and then maybe we'll put, you'll put them together. Um, the crew, I, I spoke to the cinematographer a great deal before I left the country, uh, this, the US. I wanted the same cinematographer in India and in New Orleans because I wanted a flow in the visual style. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked a lot, I showed him photographs, images of India and we talked about what we were going for, uh, whether it was through the photographs of a very well-known Indian photographer named Raghubir Singh, mm -hmm. or artwork that showed the colors and the abstraction that could, that could be pushed into. Mm -hmm. Then while I was in India, we had Skype, thank God. So that was our production table. And we would talk regularly through Skype about what could be shot, what kinds of images we were looking for, uh, what colors, what lights, what time of day the river looked. Right, I, I, I love that because that's what I do uh, in terms, we, you know, we both talked about the amount of research has to happen before you even, but I like the idea that you bring the artwork, you know, it, you know what is that so that there's a starting point and, and tonality and, and the palette and uh, uh, knowing that light and music all create a visceral experience for us as witnesses to the story. So absolutely. And, you know, images speak to an image maker like a cinematographer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the art, uh, the images of artwork and photographs meant something to him. He could read them. Right. And I have to add one thing. It wasn't just the crafts that are so visible on screen that mattered to me. It was down to my production manager in India. Um, I wanted someone who would understand what it meant to shoot in the village. There are different kinds of production managers, you know. Did you know him or was that someone that was um, uh, um, uh, was uh, what's the word I'm looking introduced for? Introduced to me. Yes. I met, I met him through other people because I do know people, filmmakers in India. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they understood right away what I meant, that I wanted a production manager who knew how to relate, to connect. connect right, right. To people in a village. And that was key to the film. Uh, just like in New Orleans, I wanted a production manager and a sound recordist who knew the city and knew how to connect and be in the city, in that place. So what were your, <laughs> I always say, okay, you gotta, as, as, as a filmmaker, or, you know, you have to have the plan A, the plan B, C, and Murphy. <laughs> yeah. 
Did Murphy, did Murphy make a visitation at any of these locations that you went to? Well, he haunted me throughout every moment of my time on the shoot everywhere. There's no doubt about it. But, you know, you do make a plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D. And then my approach is put the plan B, plan C, and plan D in a deep, deep fridge. Mm -hmm. Keep them there if you need them. Don't think about them. Focus on plan A. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what were, just give me, well, you could say one, but I'm going to say three. Give me three of the challenges as a filmmaker that you, uh, uh, whether it was uh, in New Orleans or in India, what were your, what were the filmmaking challenges? There were many, many filmmaking challenges as a theater person, you know that. So let, I'm just going to pick three off the top of my head. Good. Um, in New Orleans, one challenge was how do we evoke the history? Ah. Uh, there, the men came from India in the late 19th century before the a Asian Exclusion Act of 1924. They uh, found a welcome in the African-American community all along the East Coast. New Orleans was a thriving port. Many went there. They married into African-American families. How do we show that? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there were, the, there's very little historical documentation of our communities, yours and mine. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't want the same look as some of these, what little we found could offer. Because my feeling was that there's no doubt there was tremendous uh, hostility towards both these peoples vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis the outside world. But what was going on within the community? What kept them going through the years? Mm -hmm. Hostility doesn't keep you going. What kept them going, I thought, was the spirit within their community, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the life of the community, um, the marriages between Indian men and African women. I think that's about love as well as sociology. Absolutely, 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 and and and. No, for the commonality. Remember, we had taught. I kind of said to you, um, and it, it applies to the relationship, but just applies to the work that you do and the interconnectedness and being in a port and how uh, the migration of people and um, knowing that there is a commonality of survivorship, and 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 I think when you have people of color automatically there is that, that common denominator of being an outsider. We had talked about, um, um, you know, when I was in Africa and, and, and directing that show, and I knew that I had to own the ownership of being an outsider, not going into the place, thinking you know the place. And I told you that, that the, the quote that my godmother had said was, in order to know a man, you must know his God, his culture, um, which is, is important. So you're thinking about this Indian, uh, uh, you know, coming in to this place as an outsider and the mother already that have been placed in a systemic outsider place, right. you know, coming together in the survivorship. Plus they have the same color. <laughs> That's right. The same color. There's also that uh, the I think this may sound trivial, but I think it matters the importance of food. And uh, even if the foods are slightly different, the fact that you value food, yeah. the fact uh, that you value family. Right. Right. All these things are important. And uh, I think there's a lot to be said for the African-American community that welcomed these men from my Indian community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's wonderful. Right. Uh, and it shows how we can all do it. 
if we want. Um, notice the animation. When did you make the choice? Was that pre-production or did you make that as a part of how did you choose animation to be included in the documentary? That decision came later. As it evolved that we weren't finding the archival footage that spoke to us for this story, mm -hmm. we thought, why not try animation? And it was a matter of finding an animator that would understand the story again, what I spoke about before, the liveliness, the spirit of different peoples coming together, being fascinated and finding each other strangers, but still coming together. And how can you capture that? And animation is always a concern in this sense because it comes on so late in the story. Mm -hmm. You've already decided how you're telling the story, the pace, the rhythm, the mood, and will the animator understand all of that and fit into it? And she did, she did. She did a great job in New Orleans. She did a great job in India where we were playing with past and present. Who were these men? How did they know of America? So um, I'm glad we made that choice. You said something also that was fascinating that I wanna share with everyone out there is when we were talking about your, uh, um, your expectation of the filming and uh, how you, I, I said, you know, how you went, okay, there might, there was a, there was a, a point there where you didn't even know if you were ever going to find that village. So can you speak to me about <laughs> the expectation well, going and then really, you know, being in midst of all of that would happen? Well, that's where the plan B, plan C, plan D and comes in and it, they're in the deep fridge, not allowed. Murphy, go away. Uh, I have work to do. Uh, there was, you know, finding the village was an enormous challenge. The village is not on the map. It's a remote interior village. By remote, I mean separated from the rest of the world. It's only in, what, maybe an hour, hour and a half outside Kolkata, the mm -hmm. capital city of that area. But it's... Um, it stays within, the people stay within themselves. They've been there for generations. And most people hadn't, didn't know where it was. I found it by just spreading the word all over the, the city. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. there are people whose ancestral family homes are outside the city. There are people who travel outside the city. You just never know. Right, right, right. And I'm really grateful to everyone for their enthusiasm about this story because phone calls were flying all over. She's looking for this village. Have you heard of it? Where? No, I don't know how to say it, but she said it's like this, but maybe it's, it just, they really worked hard. And I was very lucky that, I, well, I was lucky and I am grateful for their believing in this seemingly crazy, question of where is this village and I love the idea that like you said who knew I was and I would say the ancestors did because it was a meant to be it was a meant for her to have and her family to have that completion and yes. and and knowing that the spirit of her father grandfather 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 grandfather, grandfather yeah. was with her through the whole journey Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I think Shake and Teeny, the grandparents are with us right here on this Zoom. Right, right. I believe that, you know, and I think it means a lot to all the families who have grandparents from India, grandfathers from India, because I've heard from them. Right. It, it places them in this in history, it places them in the yesterday, it places them in today. Yeah. So I, oh gosh, see, I could talk to you all day, but uh, we're getting the high sign. But I wanted to um, ask you one more question for those young filmmakers or not so young filmmakers or the, anyone wanting to do this. What would be something that you, 
imparts your wisdom if you're uh, 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 to a young filmmaker who wants to go into documentaries? Follow your heart as well as your mind. Make the film you want to make. Tell the story that's important to you because that's why we need you as a filmmaker. And don't always listen to others. Okay, okay. I have one more. I have one more, Cheryl. Where, where does most of your, do you have to go out and write grants and stuff to, to gather the funding for the other projects that you have? Absolutely. I have to coax, cajole, provoke, convince <laughs> funders all the time. Okay. Well, thank you. I love this film. I love um, the heart of this film. I love that you've introduced the world to how with who we are as different tribes and the tribes coming together and really combining to make the human tribe. So thank you very much for your work and I'm looking forward to your next story. Thank you so much, Cheryl, and we will talk again. Who knows, we may collaborate. That's right, <laughs> why not? That would be great. Okay, bye. bye.